Hello and welcome. Here we are in lecture 13. So today's a really fun lecture. Today we're going to show this whole Agile process in action. So in today's lecture, we're going to show iterative development actually as a process. We're going to, you know, do as we always keep saying, like this logo, you know, close the loop, so to speak, right? So um, today's experience, we're going to design a queue, which you've seen queues quite a bit. We've shown it in the context of the couple, we've shown it in the context of making a testing class. Today we're going to show a queue in the context of actually performing uh, iterative agile development. So um, to kind of set it up, we're going to talk about how we design for reuse and how we design a queue and then actually go through the process of starting simple, making something that works, close the loop, and then actually improving it. So we're going to go over our notebook first. Uh, OK, comes in just a second, hopefully. Yep, great. OK, so when it comes to reuse, right, uh, what's the goal? Well, the goal is you make something that someone, yourself, someone else could reuse, right? So, well, if it's reusable, better do something that people find useful, right? Um, and in particular, the kind of key word here I'm using is pattern, right? Where sometimes it's really clear you have an exact module what I need. Like, oh, yes, I need a, you know, I2C encoder or something like that. OK, sure. but. Uh, in this class, we're excited about more broad types of reuse with generators to kind of recognize a pattern. Okay, you need something to kind of solve a certain case. In today's talk, we're going to talk about queues, right? Where queue is someone has the need of, you know, a FIFO needs to buffer. And well, we can imagine various types of ways we need to parameterize that, but more generally, they have this you know, need for this pattern of buffering, right? And so as we design these generators, the goal is to include just enough parameters in generation to support the user's needs, right? If it's too specific, too narrow, you know, it's only a four entry queue, maybe that won't solve their needs, right? And so that's something that keeps in mind. Now, despite this lofty goal of a, you know, flexible, parameterizable generator, I don't want them to get led in the way of actually designing working hardware, right? So that's this next slide. The idea is, okay, let's go ahead and get something working and keep making it bigger, right? It's hard to get it all at once. And this is kind of the whole agile premise, right? We're gonna do something simple, Get it working, close the loop, you know, actually get this thing running in simulation, maybe even push it through physical tools, see how it goes, and then go ahead and add functionality on, right? And whenever you look at the functionality you're trying to build, look at every piece of functionality, not so much as how important it is to for the final product, also look at every piece of functionality for how important it is to get done for developing things. You recognize, you know what? This feature is really important, but it's also really complicated. Let's defer this until we have enough of this other stuff working first, and then we can get on to that bigger, harder feature. Right, so I said, look for opportunities to kind of defer things for later in development and try and get the simplest, easiest things going and kind of build your way up, right? So when you're doing it, the goal is, okay, what's, what's the simplest thing you can build? What does it mean to close the loop? In this case, we're saying, you know, let's test it. Um, and then making a plan. Uh, okay, I'm gonna first implement this, test it this way. I'm gonna add this thing on. I'm gonna add test it this way. And you keep going. And that's kind of the plan. And you, you start making this plan and then it's great. And then you build this thing and you're like, oh my gosh, this plan's not gonna work. Make a new plan. You're allowed to revise the plan, right? The, the point of Agile is you can't have a plan, you can't change a plan. The point of Agile is just saying that the goal is to get the smallest thing working first, smallest thing possible working first, and then kind of build onto it rather than building a big thing and then hoping it all comes together, right? Um, from personal experience or from industry's experience, you can learn that these big things all hoping to come together, they really come together. It's usually a real pain. Um, so you want to kind of incrementally build your way up. Cool, questions on this? Cool, okay, so let's talk about queues. So I think by now we're, we're pretty familiar with queues, right? We're gonna have, you know, the uh, two of the couple interfaces, one for enqueuing, one for dequeuing. So, you know, a natural thing you might want is perhaps have a parameterizable depth to our queue, as well as be able to have an arbitrary data type for using in the queue. Those are pretty reasonable requests. Um, now, if you really wanna get what else you might care about, maybe you care about how power efficient is or how area efficient is or how fast it is in terms of cycle time or clock period for getting through here. Um, cool, those are all pretty neat goals. And of course, the Chisel Standard Library includes a queue. So, you know, in practice, you should use their queue. But for today, we're going to build one ourselves to kind of see this process. And so just the last slide I told you, our goal should be to figure out what's the simplest thing we can get running and then go ahead and augment that, right? So what can we make simpler? Well. Maybe for these parameters of queue depth and data type, maybe those can be fixed at first, right? We have a single depth and maybe a single data type, right? How about performance? 
it's okay maybe if we're correct, but slow at first, right? It's okay, and then we'll kind of start making it go faster and faster. So today we're going to see multiple versions of this queue, right? So our v0, what are we going to do? Well, make it as simple as possible to kind of just test some stuff out. So uh, our v0 queue is going to uh, have a single entry. We're not having to set parameterize the type, or we could parameterize the type. It's a single entry is a key point. Okay, so what do we need for Q? Well, we need a, a single entry. The bits come in, the bits come out. And then we need to kind of you know, do this ready valid thing on both sides, right? So somehow we need to do that logic. I put a question mark here because we don't quite know the logic at first, right? Um, we also need another one bit register here to keep track of what, whether a Q is empty or full, right? Is there anything in this register or not? Okay. Um, we actually are going to have the pipe is true behavior. Remember, pipe is true meaning I can NQ if I'm DQing, even though I'm full, right? That's kind of the thing. Uh, but we're not going to do the bypassing. Okay. Cool. Questions on our setup. Let's go and try and code this up. So uh, for the IO, we're just going to have two decoupled interfaces. Remember, by default, the couple's in the output direction, so that's fine for output. But for the input direction, we need to flip it. Okay. We can go ahead and have a parameterized bit width because why not? That's really easy to do in Chisel. Um, but I'd also be perfectly fine to say net to a constant because, hey, let's make it simple for the first version. Um, in terms of the internals, well, we have that one element as an as a entry, sure. That full bit, sure. It's a single bit register. And then we got, got kind of need to do the rest, right? So we have all these various um, control things we need to set, right? Uh, so for example, when are we ready to receive? Well, if we're not full, that's a good time to receive something. Uh, or if we're firing, remember the, the, the firing on the DQ side means this is, this is pipe equals true parameter. Uh, when are we valid? When is something coming out is legitimate? Uh, if we're full, right? And you know what their what their output bits? They're always the entry. Okay, that's easy. Um, now for the conditions that come up, if I'm firing, you know someone's coming out of the queue. I actually don't need to change anything other than remembering the fact that I'm empty. And then um, if I'm receiving something, that's when I actually go ahead and write to the end, to the bits here. Uh, and I also mark myself as full. So uh, this queue, uh, we believe, is mostly correct. A lot of these intermediate designs have not been as regularly tested. And interestingly enough, uh, this lecture was a impetus for a guest lecturer last year who's an expert in verification who actually found a couple bugs in his later queue designs and we fixed them according to the suggestions. But uh, you know, uh, some of these bugs are, you, you might call them bugs, others might say, you know what, it's a case where we are, we should change the spec to match the reduced functionality we provide. But the thing I'm most excited about, and the reason why we're doing all this, is hey, here, let's make this big, complicated thing while we build a super fancy queue. Get something simple going, right? So this is something maybe, it's not trivial, maybe spend a little bit of time thinking about this. And then we go ahead and model it. We had this model in the prior lecture for testing. The only difference is now we have a really complicated thing down here for the NQ ready. And the reason why it's so complicated, we're trying to perfectly match the behavior of this pipe parameter. So uh, for this particular uh, case where pipe is true, this isn't a big deal. Some of our future designs are actually not pipe equal to false. And so I, I have made this model more complicated. You can imagine if we were truly imbibing this iterative agile approach, maybe we would hard code our model to be always pipe equals true. And then for the future one, we're essentially false to add that functionality back in. But for today to load us in once, that's the way it is. Um, and if it's a lot too complicated, don't worry about it. You can kind of just trust me it's right, and I hope it's right too. Um, OK, we keep going. Uh, this is the harness from before. And the harness, you know, we did the work to make sure we set the signals correct in the right order, which is a little scary. People are right to be concerned about that. Uh, but go ahead and run it. So what happens? Well, uh, hopefully it works. Yes, it does. So we, you know, are successfully able to NQ01. Uh, we try to NQ a the two right away, it actually doesn't go in there because we're not dequeuing. But then when we are actually enabling things to be dequeued, it actually gets in. Great. Now, I want to go back to one detail. Uh, so normally in hardware, you're thinking things is kind of always existing and uh, you know, order doesn't matter. And for most things, order does not matter. For example, like these IO DQ bits, we only connected this in one place. so. I could scramble these lines however I wanted and that would have no impact. Now when you have one block, 
Remember when have potential of having conditional connects and there was an effect to in multiple places. We have a situation. So for example, uh, here we have full in two places, right? So for the says full is in two places. Um, the last of these connects that's applied is going to be the one that wins, so to speak, right? So in other words, if it's only IODQ false, fire, then this one's true. If it's both, this is the one that's going to win because it's later in a program order. So an example of this, if I reverse the order of these blocks, it might actually break this queue. It may not for the test cases we have. doesn't mean it's okay, but uh, let's see what happens. Nope. No, no, no. We broke it. Uh, and I broke it in more ways than one, apparently. Type mismatch. That's not what we expected. We expect it to be a synthesis violation. Oh boy, the fun never stops in this class. Okay, let's try that one more time. Okay, that's what we expected. So it, it didn't load correctly. But yes, so we can see that, yeah, we, we failed an assertion. Um, so if you're wondering, oh, it must be nice having correct test cases. Having your test cases correct, you spend effort on them. <laughs> uh, it's not always automatic. Uh, and I'm excited to do formal in, I guess, over a week when we have you know additional tools to make better test cases. But yeah, so okay, so we have a working queue. Um, getting the exact logic right, I mean, it's a little bit quick. We can flash you on a lecture screen, but that's fascinating. It's doing it again. So somehow it's like not remembering the type it just saw. So. So we compile this here. I need to rebuild the handshake, and then you're gonna be happy. Okay, gives me to learn that difference. Okay, um, sure. Okay, so let's take score of what we just did. Technically, it's a queue. Check influence queuing behavior. We parameterize the data width. It's still arbitrary number of bits of u in. It's not an arbitrary type. It's just arbitrary with you int, but we have a plenty of shortcomings. We only bought a list one of them, which is that it's only one entry, right? So it's not only really a parameterized queue, it's a one entry thing. In other words, it's a register, right? It has some handshaking with ready valid to be a little more sophisticated, but it's, it's, it's one entry. Okay, so how can we go about doing that? Well, as a more uh, aggressive architecture, let's go ahead and add in multiple registers, right? Now, how we manage all these registers might be a little bit confusing, right? Might be a little bit unsure about how we go about enqueuing these all or going about it. Once again, think simple, get something working, and then make it better second, right? So for our first design, we're going to do a shift register. So that pipe thing we talked about before, and just, you know, it comes in blindly from one side, goes out the other side, and just, you know, shuffles through. And so you can imagine there's some shortcomings to that. We'll deal with those in future versions. But for now, we're going to have multiple entries, right? So for every... Data entry, you can also have a single bit, you know, the entry to also track if there's any data in that corresponding thing. And you see this kind of behavior we're going to have of shifting down, right? Where we have things coming in and we shift everything ahead with time it comes through. And somehow, based on all the logic and the full empty bits, we need to communicate back to the external users, you know, how are we doing on ready and valid. Okay. So given that, here's what we get. Uh, so we have our entries. We're going to have you know some number of entries, so we go ahead and use a seek to hold the registers. Okay, so we have seek number of registers. Sorry, uh, number of entries, number of entry registers. We also have the full bits. So one of these bits means that corresponding index is full in the entries. Um, in this case, we're initializing them all to zero. We don't care what additional value, the data values actually. Now we're setting the internal convention of we are going to NQ into the maximum index and DQ from the lowest index. That's just the choice we made, right? We could have done it the other way around. We could have come in at zero and gone out 31, whatever we wanted to do, but this is the choice we made. And I wrote it down in the comments, so we wouldn't forget it. Okay, and then let's see how it fills in, right? Okay, so for example, let's say we're shifting down. So when should we shift down? Well, if someone's DQing, yeah, that makes sense. Or if it turns out the head is not full. So in other words, if this entry is labeled as empty, we might as well shift down to keep going until we find someone that's there, right? It could be the case if people could be enqueuing arbitrarily, so we have some bubbles kind of in here, and so we want to kind of squish that, squeeze out those bubbles. Okay, so we shift down in those cases. So when are we ready to dequeue? Oh, sorry, when are we ready to enqueue? Well, 
if there's free space in the last element, sure, that, that full bit's not set. Or if we're shifting down, it's that pipe equals true behavior we're talking about. How about if we're valid to DQ? Well, there's something in the last bit, in the last entry, the one that's to come out, sure. And there, you know, we're gonna data from there. Now to come to shifting down, the way we code this up is a for loop, right? So we can just say, hey, for every entry, connect to one more. And so even though this for loop is set this way, this only has impact, you know, when we're shifting down. And then we're in queuing, we can kind of bring things to another end. Whew, okay. I'll talk about this in a second, but I'm gonna pause for any questions so far. Okay, so this uh, should work. Let's go ahead and try it out. Yeah, so this is a similar test case. In this case, now we're doing multiple entries. You can trust the fact there's no red text in this, this pass. Let's look at the queue for a second. Um, so I wanted to highlight this text down here for a moment. Uh, so what is that? Uh, that does the same as these two one blocks up here using the functional program we talked about last week. So you can see, you know, this tool used correctly is extremely powerful, uh, but it's also pretty dense, right? Like looking at that code, you're like, does it do the same thing? Is it right? Um, and so you may be wondering, wait, how could it do the same thing? Because here we have two different conditions. We have shift down, IO, and Q fire, two different conditions. One's shifting down, one's enqueuing. How can they be merged together? Well, this is one of the advantages of fold write versus even you know, something like reduce, is that we actually have that initial value. So basically, by sending this initial value intelligently, in this case, the bits coming in from the IO or the fire condition, that initial value, someone's kind of get the right parameterized behavior. Another thing to point out, which this might be the first time I've seen this all quarter. I'm using a semicolon inside of a Scala, and I'm using it here to get two lines in this function. The reason why, of course, is we want the side effect in the first thing, and then we need to return something. So we're going to go ahead and return that in the second thing. That's why it's two lines kind of squeezed in there. So that's, that's pretty gnarly, right? Um, and then if you go home and stare at this, you're actually going to figure out that these two one blocks and these this one one block are actually not perfectly equivalent. There's actually a couple of corner cases where this one is going to behave a little differently, and arguably it'd be at least a bug, if not just a different semantic different uh, uh, functional difference. But or sorry, a, a spec difference. But I still want to include the kind of show statistic as possible, right? Here we kind of have this pattern of recurrence. You can do recurrence of a fold operation. In this case, we're doing a fold right because uh, we're going from decreasing indices rather than increasing indices. Otherwise, that'd be a fold left. But yeah, I just want to kind of show that was possible. Um, oof, questions? Yeah, so sometimes we use Justice Lee. I think this one's a little more complicated, but I'm gonna keep showing there's some value to it. Um, cool. Let's take stock of what we did. So we're still in the queue. Now we've parameterized number of entries. Cool, making progress. Uh, is this done? No, it's not done, right? Uh, there's a few, a few issues. Right? Number one is the fact that we just kind of always put stuff in the other end, right? So it always comes in here, always comes out there. It's, it's kind of this latency of num entries, right? There's no way we can get through here any faster in num entries. Even if there's nothing in this queue, you still need to wait num entries for it to get through the whole thing, right? Um, so that's kind of a problem. Uh, and then, um, if there's bubbles, you know, I'm in queuing for a while and I stop in queuing and send more bubbles. You have problems and you can see I'm even suggesting depending on which code you're using, like that functional programming code, it may not handle bubbles well. So this is one of these ones where technically we made progress, but maybe not great progress. Maybe you don't want to embrace something that's going to be incorrect, but as you're iteratively designing things, give you an iterative, uh, you know, intermediate stage of, you know, building your design, doesn't mean it's a released version of your design. This means internally you've now Accomplish some things. We can accomplish parameterized depth, but we need to kind of keep making it better and more useful. Okay, so given that, let's go ahead and try to make it better. So, what if we want to squish out those bubbles, right? So how can we squish out those bubbles? Well, we could always dequeue in the same place, but we're going to choose where we enqueue based on where there's room, right? So, we're going to enqueue in the deepest element that's free. And so that way, we can minimize the latency, right? They're in the first free slot. And so you may be wondering, well, how do we know what is the first free slot? 
that's where priority encoder comes in, right? That's where we know, oh wait, yeah, there's uh, uh, some space there, right? That's where that comes in. So we're gonna take our design from the prior one, even though it wasn't perfect, and put some priority encoder to make it a lot better, right? So um, what are we gonna do? Well, we have our full bits from before. Now what's interesting is we start doing some fun math on this, right? So for example, this is a, uh, a um, VEC of one bit entries, right? Reg of VEC as it goes on the outside, right? And in this case, we actually filled it in full of a seek, right? Okay, yeah, but the seek's just initialized the vector, it's a VEC, okay. So actually, okay, these bits, if they're one, that means entry's full. So if we want the inverse of that, we want bits where it means if it's a one, if it's empty, we can just go and negate them all. So that's what the empty bits are. So we go through each one of the full bits and we're mapping that onto a not gate. So that's pretty cool. So we can just do, this one I think is a pretty nice little easy functional programming snippet, right? We can quickly do that little change and we make it really clear how it's happening. Okay. So then if I want to ask the question, for example, is there any space? Well, if there's any space, there should at least be one empty bit, right? So I'm going to take the or reduction on all of these bits, right? So in other words, if any of these empty bits is true, that means I have one entry that's free. So right now we're not going to do that pipe equals true. We're going to do actually new pipe equals false in this case, right? If it's if I'm full, I'm full. It doesn't matter from DQing, we're going to say I'm full, right? Um, but cool, this is pretty neat. We can just do a little bit of functional programming here inside. I would argue this is very nice uses of it. These are very concise, hopefully clear situations. Now, so there's other things. For example, what about dequeuing, right? Okay, well, we're valid to dequeue if that last entry, so head is a zero, so Scala syntax shorthand for that, is, is true, and the bits come from that corresponding entries. Now, when it comes to how these you know, things behave, well, uh, let's see how we kind of put this together. For the dequeuing, maybe that's easier, and actually put this first in program where you want to have the behavior for stateless that way. Um, if we're doing a DQ, well, because we better mark that entry as empty, right? And then we're going to shift down everything else, right? We're going to shift down all the other entries to fill in. So that's going to be kind of imagine, okay, if we go back to the picture, when we DQ, we're setting this bit to false, and then everything else we're shifting down into it. Okay, and it shifts these down too. Okay, cool. Now for enqueuing, we want to find um, the, fir the first free spot, right? So uh, we use a priority encoder for that. And yeah, we just find the first free index. And then uh, given that index, we're going to go ahead and write to it. Now, you may be looking at some other code here saying, what's going on with some mux and stuff? Uh, basically, what's happening is there was the one the bugs found by the verification expert. If you're in a situation where you are dequeuing and enqueuing at the same time, and this is independent of pipe being true, and if you have, let's say, half full, all the elements are going to shift down. So if a certain element appears to be empty, let's say element four it appears to be empty, um, but because it's shifting down, it's actually going to be four is still going to stay empty. But three is now going to become empty too because it's shifting down, right? And so that's kind of what's going on. So basically, what it's saying is, hey, if I am also dequeuing, meaning I'm shifting down, subtract one from the next you're trying to fill into, right? In other words, we go back to this picture. Let's say right now this is empty, so that should go here. By the time I'm actually writing, if, it's, if I'm dequeuing, this, is going to be, this empty slot is going to shift to down one. So if I don't subtract one from the index I'm writing to, that's going to have that issue. This also explains why I'm wondering why I chose to have zero as my Exit point, the reason why is it naturally corresponds to our priority encoder. Our priority encoder, by default, goes reverse order, right? It goes so lower is better, and so we want to go in the first lowest free bit. Um, cool. Okay, I'm going to pause for any questions so far. If you're looking at this stuff and you're saying, this is confusing, or can I write this in five minutes? No, you can write this in five minutes. But I'm showing it to you in five minutes, so you can kind of see how it goes through the design process. Go ahead. How did I decide that regress in the pipe equals true requirement? Um, because honestly, just doing it would mean more complexity. And so kind of my mentality is sometimes, like I said, when it comes to doing this iterative approach, if you see an opportunity to make things simpler, do it, right? So you're right, maybe the original sin was doing this on V0 because 
Maybe V0 can be even more simple. Uh, but yeah, in this case, we regress in that one functionality to get something else. And so, like I said, if you have a publicly released product, sometimes you're hesitant to regress, but if you're doing internal development, you're just doing this incrementally. It's okay to regress a little bit and then come back to it, right? Because it's like, yeah, it's simpler for me to figure out, oh man, I'm trying to understand this, how this priority curve is going to work, get that working, and then I can worry about how to do things simultaneously. So we'll, we'll, we'll bring it back in just a second. It's just momentarily deciding that's one thing too complicated. Yes. Yeah, so part of, yeah, they clarified the question. Yeah, so part of my process is to definitely, every step of the way, and I have a new task to do. If a task starts proving to be hard or appears to be hard, I will do everything I can to make it a smaller task. And the easiest tool we have is to defer functionality. It doesn't mean you're not going to do it. It just means you're going to do it in the next version. So it's a really incremental, right? Add a little functionality, add a little test to exploit that, and then once that's working, great. Keep going from there. Um, as you can imagine, you can get perhaps too small a step at a time, or it's like so much time to spend the tools and like a baby step at a time. I think baby steps are good, but maybe not like a micro baby step. So figure out what the right level of complexity per you know iteration is. Yeah, so in this case, yeah, it was a, it was a choice just that, you know, getting that logic right seemed a little tricky. Uh, as I mentioned here, this went out the first quarter and nobody raised an eyebrow and then the verification was like, no, 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 uh, you, you got that wrong. <laughs> and so, I'm like, oh, a pipe equals false. And he's like, no, no, no. Even when a pipe equals false, if you're half full, this, this bug will arise. <laughs> and so it's, it's, it's good to kind of check these things. And so, yeah. Yeah, so following their suggestion. Oh, no, no, sorry, does my test capture that? No, it does not. Uh, my test should capture that. That's a good point. So is my test case complicated enough to capture that case? No, it's not. So my tests for this lecture, I would say, are pretty uh, in, inadequate. Um, you can see in this case, it's only three cycles, right? Uh, so yeah, the three cycle test case is not going to exercise neither the bug before or a case now to show certain behavior now. It's too simple. And so to talk more generally about testing, right? The thing about testing is you often worry about coverage, right? You know, how many possible conditions have I considered? Um, have I considered all the ones that might arise? And yeah, with three cycles of testing, I probably have pretty poor coverage. Uh, so when it comes to dynamic testing, we'll get more aggressive and you'll learn how to be more aggressive and more intentional about it. We're also going to cover formal testing, which is still an emerging field, but it's now included in Chisel. And yeah, with that, you can also, for some types of assertions, actually get, you know, complete coverage, right? Because it's formally proven based on the design statically, you know, this is going to be locked in. But you're right. I mean, this test case obviously is trivial, right? So the fact there was a bug and it was never caught before is not surprising because this code is complicated enough that just looking at it for the first time, you may not notice certain things about it, and that test case is definitely not going to exercise that issue. But I think the real point today, I'm happy to ask that question, is just thinking about, okay, how can I keep picking incremental increases in complexity and challenge you know, of, of what I'm building functionality-wise to kind of get someplace? Because the goal is to get something that looks kind of like a chisel queue, but it's hard to do it all at once, right? So trying to kind of build our way to it. And yeah, as part of the development, you may be changing not only your design, you may be Augmenting your test cases, maybe even changing your test harness. I mentioned earlier how that Q model I showed is a little bit complicated because it had both pipe equals true and pipe equals false. You can imagine that um, you probably should write it only one way originally and then put that parameterized ability where you need that. So, for example, this one actually sets pipe equal to false. That's what that parameter right there is. And I'm not going super detailed in the test cases because it's kind of a hand wavy thing showing it works for some very lightweight demonstration. Um, perhaps I was more honest, I would really able to slide as demoing my QV2 rather than testing my QV2. Um, perhaps. Okay, cool. So let's go ahead and assess what we've done. Uh, so we have queuing behavior. We still have parameterized data with a number of entries. Unlike the last one, and this is the, you know, the, the key improvement, our latency is now based on how full it is, right? If our queue is empty, it goes in and it comes up the next cycle. It doesn't need to wait, you know, n cycles. That's, that's a big improvement. Now, what are, we, what are we missing? Well, we just talked about it. We intentionally regressed on this pipe equals true feature, right? So we can't simultaneously NQ and DQ to a full queue. Um, some other things which are maybe more subtle, we don't in this course class talk a lot about physical design concerns, but from a power point of view, this is actually not very efficient. If you go back to the design, uh, every time you shift down, all of these bits are moving. That's a lot of bits sloshing around, right? You can imagine these two entries might be like 512 bits each, maybe so you know cache lines like that, right? Oh my gosh, it keeps sloshing 
And the thing is, like, you know, let's say this queue is full. Every register is toggling. That's a lot of toggling. It's a lot of slashing. A lot of slashing bits, a lot of energy. The other thing is the priority encoder. If you learn inside this priority encoder, it could be a sequence of AND gates, it could be a sequence of MUXs, but there's some amount of logic depth based on the number of entries in the priority encoder, right? So if I have like a two entry queue, yeah, who cares? If I have a 500 entry queue, that priority encoder is going to be substantial. It's going to potentially be a critical path for our clock period, right? So these are some physical concerns we don't normally consider in this course, but just for today's lecture, we're kind of talking about some of them. Okay, so that's the shortcoming of the architecture. So how can we go about uh, fixing this? Does anyone have an idea? I'll give you a hint. There's, an, there's another architecture that uh, the latency grows much more slowly compared to number of entries. Wanna go ahead? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, so if you're unsure, we'll go ahead and see that next slide. Okay, so uh, that's the idea. We're gonna have a circular buffer, right? So um, we're gonna have a memory and you're gonna write into the memory. Once you write it in there, it stays in place. You don't shift it around. What shifts are these pointers. So I, I call them in and out here. Um, so this is a more general concept. This comes up in systems all the time. It's, it's called a circular buffer. This is a classic like C programming trick if you're doing like, you know, network, that kind of stuff. So basically what you can have is you can have the effect of a FIFO without any shift bits, right? So you, the reason why, you know, in software and C you want this is that way you write the data once into an array, right? And then you don't need to worry about shifting it. You just move your pointers and you get the right behavior. Um, for us in hardware, it's good because, yeah, keeping data in place saves energy. Uh, we don't have to spend power energy moving it. And then um, we got to get these pointers right. So how do these pointers work? Well, one pointer represents the front of the queue, one pointer represents the end of the queue. So when it comes time to dequeue, you just take whatever the outer is pointing to, and then you advance this pointer by one. When you want to end queue, you write into the entry pointed to by in, and you move it over. Now, I keep saying the word pointer, that's kind of what we're used to from like software, you know, pointing to memory addresses. In the case of hardware, these are perhaps maybe better termed indices, right? Like index into memory, so some address, right? So that's kind of the key idea. Now, the other key idea is that we say it's circular. So what do you mean by circular? Well, you can imagine if we keep, you know, enqueuing and dequeuing, these two indices keep moving over, and at some point they're gonna to need to wrap around. That's a circular nature. But basically you can use all these elements to kind of fill it in. Or can we use them all? That's this next point. So we have these two pointers, and especially if they're wrapping around, it could be the case that in is less than out. It could be the case that in is greater than out. So how do I know if I'm full or empty? As a simplification, let's try this, right? Let's say, you know what? If the pointers are equal, we're empty. And if they're full, in is going to be one less than out uh, with wrapping, right? So let's say, you know, you can imagine that maybe in's here and out's over here or something like that. But it is one less than out. So wait a second. Uh, if I do that, does that mean I can use all the elements? No, technically I'm only able to use n minus one of my elements. Simplification, we'll come back to that. Um, that's kind of the idea. So we have these point, these two pointers or two indices that go around. When they reach the end, they wrap around. We're gonna insert whatever the in's pointing to, and then we increment. We you know dequeue whatever the out's pointing to, and we increment it. So never use one of these indices, we're just gonna take it and increment, and then they're gonna wrap. Questions? Cool. Okay, so um, that's the idea. Let's go ahead and try and write this up. So uh, you can see another regression here. Uh, I'm going to require a number of entries to be a power of two. Uh, why did I do that? Uh, that makes the wrapping easy. I just add one. I don't need to think about how to do the wrapping. So it's an example of, you know, here we are doing some things better, but some of the full richness is a little bit complicated. Let's go ahead and do it simpler first. We're gonna get it working. We'll come back to that restriction. We'll, come, we'll relax that in a second. But for now, it's okay. And then in terms of the entries, well, we'll go ahead and have a reg of X, sure. Um, now it's interesting, rather than full empty bits, we just have these two pointers, right? These pointers, are just registers, right? So we have a register for enqueuing, a register for dequeuing index. And so we define those logic in the prior slide, right? We are empty if these two are equal. And we are full, 
if NQ plus one equals DQ, that's what we said in the prior slide. That was kind of our, our logic, right? Uh, you know, empty when or equal and full when that's the case. And then, um, you know, here's the truncating addition. So that way, you know, say I have a three bit, or eight, let's say I have eight entries. So I have a three bits for these indices. You know, if I'm at seven and this is zero, you know, that plus one with trunking addition is going to be zero. So I need to worry about the wrapping. This is kind of doing the wrapping for us. Okay, so we have empty and full, and you can kind of see that kind of the control logic, right? You know, are we ready? As long as we're not full, we are, right? Uh, what about if we have anything to DQ? Well, as long as we're empty, we have something to DQ, right? And then where do we read from? This is interesting. Uh, we're going to read from wherever the DQ index tells us to read. And then um, what about uh, some of these other situations? Okay, if we're trying to DQ, we're going to advance that DQ pointer by one. If we're NQing, we write to the location currently pointed to by the pointer, and then we also advance that pointer. So the, to recap, what have we done? So we have some simplifications here, right? We said we're going to log two, or sorry, power two number of entries. And we're also going to have still, once again, revert back to pipe equal false. You said, we, we said, you know, for example, if we're full, we're, we don't care about DQ. Uh, we're, we're, we're not ready. But we'll fix that in the future version. But for initial draft, is that the idea? OK. Or question? Let's uh, get the idea of how this works. Does it make sense? Or a little bit, kind of? Um, the, the bigger picture is, you think about these FIFOs for a second. If I go baby back a little bit more. Uh, so. Uh, actually, I actually want to go back to the V1 picture. Okay, so for V1 picture, we actually had multiple registers, right? And so in this case, we had a fixed inqueuing location and a fixed dequeuing location, right? And by doing things that way, um, you know, by having both sides fixed, we were bad with bubbles, you know, we had to go through the entire thing. So then for V2, we have this priority encoder. And as a result of priority encoding, the inqueuing can be anywhere, right? DQing is still at one place, and can be anywhere. You can imagine a very similar design could perhaps have the priority encoder on the DQ side rather than the NQ side. It could, have, for example, have NQing always come here, but DQing be the first you know, free entry, right? Or the first full entry, so to speak, right? And so you can see that, okay, we can have that queuing behavior by having one side fixed, one side moving, and get that more appropriate queuing behavior. However, if one side's fixed, one side moving, for the side that's fixed, we need to keep um, shuffling data, right? In this case, you know, for example, we keep shifting down to make sure that she finds its way to down here. So in terms of data movement, okay, what's the alternative? Well, the alternative is to have both the NQ and DQ sides move, which is this guy, right? So the data stays in place. You write it once, and you move the places where you're grabbing it from. So even though it seems so simple in terms of, oh, yeah, you know, it's just these, these indices, these pointers, a lot of the heavy lifting is being done by the memory. The memory, if you think about it, uh, you know, of course, in the more general sense, it can be maybe an SRAM or something like that. But for this, it has some sort of muxing and ability to, you know, address internally. And if we're using that addressing internally, it kind of has a flexibility to NQ and DQ from anywhere, right? We're going to write to any one of these cells and read to any one of these cells. Versus our prior uh, designs did not do that, right? They were, they were more complicated. But with that, we get the advantage of keeping data in place and having some, some benefits. Cool. I'll pause for questions as I'm loading up the test case. Yes. Okay, great question. So why truncating addition? So truncating addition is due to wrap, right? So it's a truncating addition in conjunction with uh, the number of power two entries, right? So if I uh, could want to use otherwise things, right? So for example, if I have, you know, two, four, eight entries, um, just using regular binary encodings, when I get to the maximum positive value, seven, you add one, it gets to eight, right? So let's say I have, you know, eight entries. Well, so that means valid indices are from zero through seven, and I have a three-bit index, which I would, based on that math, uh, when I have seven, add one, it turns into zero if it's trunking addition. If it's not trunking addition, the result of a three-bit addition is going to be a four-bit number, and it's going to be eight, and eight's not going to be a valid index. So let's say these two things put together by right? having it be a power two number of entries plus shrinking addition, this gets the wraparounds, right? In a future design, we're going to allow for a non-power two number of entries, and we're going to recognize when it's time to wrap and actually wrap intentionally.
Oh, okay, that's a great follow-up. So repeat this for recording. Okay, yes, you uh, would have a fourth bit. However, because the DQ index is three bits, when that fourth bit that now is one be basically be ignored? Perhaps. Uh, I also bet you if our test case is so simple, uh, it's probably not going to exercise this test case. But let's go ahead and see what happens. And I suspect this will not break. But we didn't also exercise very much. This is a pretty lightweight test case. But yeah, so the point is, OK, if I let it do the full size uh, addition and then attach that to a smaller thing, would it do the right thing? Probably, but I'd rather in trusting on this later on. Basically, letting truncation happen by connection later on, I would rather probably be more deliberate about it. And this is intermediate design. Sometimes intermediate designs have these rough edges that we're going to go fix. So here I chose your trunking addition. You might let it just be a little bit more crazy, but you know, count on the fact that it's not going to impact things. Um, and the future designer will want to get that right. That's a great point. Yeah, I think you're right. It probably would work. Uh, if we had more time, I'd look at the Verilog and see how the Verilog looks and what it's doing. Um, yeah. OK, so what do we do? Well, still have a queue, parameterized, efficient latency. And the reason why we did all this is this one is more energy efficient, right? That once a big number of bits is written there, it stays in place until it's taken out. So if I have an entry queue, rather than having 500 registers writing every second I do a shift, no, I can enter input into it, and then it only is read, written once when it's going in and read once when it comes out. Otherwise, it's very efficient. So that's nice. What do we pay to get there? Well, as a vacation, we had a few things. Number one, we had uh, this issue we were just talking about um, the needed power of two number of entries. Uh, we also need uh, to have one entry always empty in order to check if we're full or not. So we'll, we'll fix that in the future version. Right. In other words, in order to be able to tell the register between empty and full, we had to kind of sacrifice an entry. So that way we never can actually use all n registers. We only can use n minus one of them. That's kind of a downside. Um, so it also has pipe equal to false, right? So once the pipe will be true eventually, we'll have the simultaneous NQ, DQ. We're going to have some, some work to do. But you can see here we are kind of taking baby steps. Right? We kind of keep changing architecture, right? We originally had just a single register. Then we had a ship register. Then we had a ship register for priority encoder. You know what? Forget all that stuff. This is just build a memory with these pointers and keep going from there. You kind of see this kind of progression of designs. And sometimes you make these changes, you'll have a bigger architectural change, so it'll be smaller, but you kind of make progress on a problem, kind of incrementally kind of keep improving things and making it better. OK, let's go ahead and, as the title says, reclaim that last entry. So we, the problem was we couldn't tell the difference between if we were empty or full to circular buffer. So the issue is if both indices are the same, Am I empty or am I full? How to tell the two apart? Well, the answer is, what if we use a one-bit register to track that difference, right? So if we have this one-bit register called maybe full, and you can see the cases down below. If indices are equal and maybe full is true, then I know I'm full. If indices are equal and the maybe full register is false, then we know I'm empty. And if indices are not equal, we know we are neither empty nor full. And we won't even look at this one bit register. This one bit register is just a little bit extra state to kind of differentiate these two cases. So now we can use every single entry in our thing. We just got to remember this one maybe full bit to kind of set this appropriately. We're only consult this maybe full bit en entry when indices are equal. When they're not equal, we don't care about it really. It kind of can be anything. So we got to add in this one little register, but it's going to change our control logic a little bit. Let's go ahead and see how that looks, right? So, for example, um, now this may be full thing. And so for example, the logic we described, this is an example of you know, trying to design where you, you know, name things to keep track of things. So for example, empty, just a val, but it helps to keep track of our logic here. So for example, we're seeing if the indices are equal and um, we are not maybe full, that's empty. Meanwhile, we're full if they're equal and maybe full is true. That's what we kind of had the prior slide. It's these two lines uh, reversed. OK. Um, what about the other stuff? Okay, for example, like before. And some of the stuff actually carries over from prior designs. For example, you know what about ready and valid, not full versus not empty? That was in V3 and V2, right? It's in v, uh, so V3 has that, uh, right? Different dimensions for empty and full, but same notion. That even goes back to V2, right? Uh, V2 also um, 
No, actually, I didn't call it there. So that's my fault. I should have made those abstractions for V2. Uh, but V3, you had those abstractions, right? We had a notion of, we define something that's called empty and full. We can kind of be very clear conceptually about what we're doing. And we go ahead and apply that. And so in this case, we changed a little bit of logic, but because it's, we had some abstraction of being empty and full, and that's still true, that kind of still is able to kind of carry over. And so this is making a new version. It doesn't mean we have to kind of toss everything out. Um, so you can kind of keep that in track. Okay. Um, so we have that, you know, possibility. And so now you can kind of see there's a little extra logic here to set the maybe full thing. So for example, if I'm DQing and the indices are not equal, then we know it's impossible for me to be full. So just to be safe, I'm going to set maybe full to false. Meanwhile, if I'm NQing and currently my NQ index is one less than my DQ index, because of NQing, I'm going to be adding one onto the NQ index, right? So it could, potentially, it could potentially, as a result of this cycle, be the same. Now, so the reason why I said could potentially, if I'm also DQing, the DQs move ahead by one. But you know what? In this case, maybe full being true prematurely, it's not the worst case scenario because we're only going to consult maybe full if the two indices are equal. But there's maybe full logic. It's one of these things where you kind of write it out and think about it, and maybe you go to home and think about it a little more. Um, I mean, it's either this one or the next one where once again our verifier found a bug. So the final version was correct, but some of the intermediate ones were not. And so you can see some of it's not always trivial, especially when you write a uh, pitiful three line test case like the next slide. Uh, it's not going to find these bugs. But questions on this? It's either this one or the next one. I forgot which one was which. You can look in the commit history. So that's the nice thing about commit. You can see where did Kevin commit on this thing. Uh, and it, it might be, I forgot which one it was. It was either be, it, yeah, so he submitted two bug fixes. Doesn't mean there's not more bugs he didn't find. But <laughs> uh, he did some formal verifications of our queues and he found some bugs. So it gives us back one more entry. So if I have, uh, you know, two entries and I have to give up one of them in order to make sure I know if I'm full or not, that's a lot of waste, right? If my entries are only eight bits, eh, who cares, right? If I have like a 512 bit entry and I pay for two and only get one, that's wasteful. With this technique, I can pay for two and get two and the cost is a one bit register. So I'd rather pay one, I would rather pay a one bit register to get back an entire entry is kind of the idea. So the entry, you know, is of arbitrary width, right? It could be small, it could be big. But it's not going to be smaller than one bit, right? So, so it's either going to be the same or more space efficient, right? That's kind of point, yeah. Yeah, so the question is, what about power performance area, PPA? Uh, you know, potentially have more complicated muxes here. Um, I don't think it's gonna come out in the bad side. I, I think you're right, the control objects are more complicated, but when it comes to, if you have a you know, bigger data type you're, you're, you're queuing, what matters is the complexity of you know, accessing the memory. Uh, so whether it be reading it there or writing it here. And there's still you know, one read port, one write port in this case. Now in this, in this particular version, I'm using a reg of vec, in a minute, we're going to use a mem, but yeah. So I, yeah, it might be the case that the logic's a little bit more complicated. Uh, I think the most noticeable PPA kind of thing might be technically it was maybe full. It could be a more complicated, I'm sorry, a longer critical path to determine if you're full because you have to do an AND gate with this other thing in there, but that's a pretty small AND gate. Yeah. But it's technically longer though. Well, so this is a one bit flip flop as opposed to a potentially 500 bit flip flop. Right, that's the difference. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you have a good does skepticism about PPA, and the answer is perhaps, but you know, show me numbers, and that's always the answer. You know, when in doubt, push it through the tools and see what the tools do, because it doesn't mean the tools are right, but you're probably going to use the output of tools rather than doing this manually. So, whatever the tools do, kind of is what becomes right. <laughs> and so, you're right, it's one of these great things where go ahead and push us through the tools and see what comes out. Um, yeah, good concern.
And you're right. When it comes to generators, right, you know, sometimes your generator to be super flexible, maybe you do things in a certain way. And perhaps if you really were at PPA, you actually want to somehow prune that functionality off efficiently. So that way it's, you know, more efficient for someone's simpler use case. And depending on your generator, that's something to consider. In this course, unfortunately, we don't have a back end. So we mostly do only front end design looking at cycles and, and components. But yeah, I've always dreamed of having a uh, back end so we could actually say, hey, you know what, this design, you know, is less adders or less mux or something like that. Cool. Okay. Um, so then, yeah, you know, it passes my trivial demo, not even a test case. So how do we, what do we do, right? So we still have our, um, you know, efficient stuff. The big difference is now we can use all of them, right? We get that one entry back. As we discussed, we're paying one extra bit and some more control logic uh, on that. So not for totally for free. Uh, what's the, what are our shortcomings? Well, we're requiring a power to because of the way we're doing wrapping. And we still can't do simultaneous NQ, DQ. That's that pipe equals false behavior. OK, so let's go ahead so we can bring some of that stuff back. So for simultaneous NQ, DQ, it's not super crazy, right? The notions of full and empty still apply. It's just that we're now ready, not only if we're not full, but even if we are false, I mean, this is going to be false. Um, if we're DQing, right? So that's actually a really simple fix, right? That wasn't super crazy. The rest of this code is basically the same. Um, however, I put this comment here, like I said before, the result is now our IO NQ ready now depends on our DQ ready. So that connection by itself is not going to cause a combinational loop. But depending on how those signals are used elsewhere in your design, they could cause a combinational loop. And it's one of these things where sometimes you and you have a combination loop in a large design, you're designing stuff, you're designing stuff, you're designing stuff, you're writing stuff, you're writing stuff, you're writing stuff. Then you're debugging something and you add in one more signal someplace and all of a sudden, bam, tools tell you the combination loop. And you're like, where, how? And you get, sometimes you, one of the ways you got to solve this is you have to go look at the block diamond of your design and just start tracing the paths of which IOs are connected to which IOs. In this case, we have a path from uh, IO ready to IO DQ ready. So, in some cases, this might cause a problem, which is why, for example, in the chisel queue, they give you a choice of disabling this, right? Because you maybe don't want to have this behavior if you have that potential thing. Um, and even if you're not worried about combinational loops, this could also increase your critical path, right? That path is longer, so that could be another issue. But uh, yeah, other than that, you know, this is basically unchanged. Go ahead and simulate and run it. Here you have a more rich test case that actually show. Um, the, the functionality of enqueuing and dequeuing to a full queue, where you know, enqueued one and two without emptying anything, and then we were able to enqueue three, which previously would have told us no, and now it doesn't tell us yes. So, to kind of even drive that home, if I go ahead and put in v4 in here, uh, it's going to fail this test case because it expects pipe equal to true. If I change that to false, now it's going to pass. You can see in this, you know, case of, you know, yeah, we enqueue one, now we have one and two in there. We ain't, can't enqueue three because <coughs> we can't sound the enqueue and dequeue. So it sees a full queue and it's not, it's holding it up. Cool. Okay, so here we are kind of taking baby steps, right? That was like a, like a one line change, perhaps more profound consequences, but a one line change, right? And so that's kind of what we're dealing with. Uh, what about one of these other things, right? So. Yeah, now we can NQ and DQ in the same cycle. That's the benefit. We added this possible combinational loop, and we still have this power of two restrictions. So we can go ahead and start attacking some of the remaining ones. OK, so um, V6 does both of these. And that's kind of why I called it, uh, you know, just tidying it up. So what do we do? Well, rather than having the wrap around, why don't we trust some component to handle the wrap for us, right? Actually. Why not use the chisel counter? They they count, and they can also be reset. So that kind of gets what we need. And you know, counters are not required to be a power two, right? It can be any number. So guess what? By using these chisel counters, not only does our code get a little simpler. Notice how I no longer say plus one and worry about wrapping anymore. I just say increment. Increment. That's nice to deal with. Um, that's cool. Uh, so that that removes that restriction. We also put our entries into a mem. 
this is not a uh, fundamental shift. It makes the code a little bit tidier, both in this side as well as in the Verilog side. When you use a mem in chisel and Verilog, it turns into an array, so the Verilog code is a little bit tighter. When you use a vec in chisel, at least for now, uh, every vec element becomes a discrete Verilog entity, right? So you have a eight element vec, you have eight wires or eight registers, whatever you're doing. And so, yeah, so when you know you want a mem, it's best to use a mem. Uh, remember, a mem still has combinational reads, right? This is not necessarily going to be an SRAM, right? This is a, a mem. For, a, for a, something like a SRAM, you're using something like a sync read mem, which has you know, one single delay to read something. But yeah, you can use mems even when you're doing combinational reads. It's a nice little tidying up. These counters kind of work. Um, and you can see, for example, it's even tidy code with some more. I decided, you know what? Why don't I have a comparison for the comparator? And then uh, I can use it like this. Um, now, contrasting that from before, we just had the comparison twice. He's saying this versus this. Harder wise, they're going to be the same. Uh, the CAD tools are capable of doing what's called common select question elimination, meaning if I wrote this exact same equality thing twice, it's going to do one equality thing and copy the result. That's fine. But it's more just in terms of what we're doing, I like this style of code better because it's more explicit, right? Here I'm saying these indices are equal, and then go ahead and compare them. And as a reminder, remember these indices are actually these counter objects, right? And so we're, we're grabbing the value out. That's why I have to get the value. Um, and then what else is going on? Oh, wait, remember this concern about the pipe, about you know having a combinational loop? Well, now I can make that a parameter. And so if pipe is true, yeah, we can let people say we're in queuing when we're both full and DQ is happening. If pipe is false, we can't do simultaneous NQ, DQ if we're full, then we don't consider that. And so, oh my gosh, this is a, you know, Scala elaboration time, you know, impact choosing how this is wired up. And that's a simple thing. Um, anything else that comes up? Okay. Uh, the logic for maybe full is a little bit simpler here. I kind of changed it. So this is actually not the exact same behavior for maybe full. But the same implications. So, as a reminder, we only consult maybe full when the indices are equal, right? So, if this is false, right, it doesn't matter what this is, right? And so, uh, the difference is through all those cases when indices are not equal, in the prior design versus this design, maybe full might have different values. But it makes the logic simpler and perhaps even easier to get correct. And as long as maybe full does the right thing when indices are equal, then we're okay. So, for example, you can see that when we are, the enqueuing and dequeuing rates are not the same. That's when we're going to change maybe full. So in other words, if I'm enqueuing and I'm not dequeuing, uh, then maybe full should be true because enqueuing is true. If I'm dequeuing but not enqueuing, then we know for sure I'm not full, right? Because for sure I'm going to have one less use, used element. So then we know for sure that Maybe a full should be false, right? So that's kind of that logic behind that. And you can see for our counters, we can just call increment. It looks almost like we're calling a function, but we're actually just the dot ink is telling Chisel to you know do connect the enable to true for the counter. And then we can grab the bits out. So this is one of these ones where this is arguably the cleanest so far. Um, and yeah, we are kind of walking this line of writing hardware and putting some software-like abstractions on top of it. As a reminder, right, when we aren't calling a function here, we are trying to call a function, but what happens in the hardware, we're just doing whatever dot ink does, and dot ink, remember, for a counter is a way of enabling the um, counting functionality. Cool. Questions? Yes. Yeah, okay, so the question is why, why mem versus regivex? So they're the exact same in many plays ways, right? Uh, in terms of you know how you access them, for both of them you you know give object name, ground parens, address. In the hardware, a mem will probably almost certainly turn into a collection registers with muxes rather than a sram. So from that point of view, they are the same. Um, I personally, as a style guide, I find it easier to look at mem than it is to look at regivec declarations. Where mem is like, oh yeah, I want num entries of this type as opposed to uh you know reg uh, in it of vec in it of seek or whatever it's just kind of a huge tangle um there are a few differences right so for example because we're using a mem 
there is no notion of initial value or reset. For instance, if I have a reg of vec, I can give you know a reg in it with a vec in it and actually have initial values. When it comes down to the varil, like I said, the mem will use a varil array versus the vec will have discrete elements. Every element will have its own variable. So yeah, but for many functional second level differences, you know, running at this level of simulation, you can't tell the difference. But if it could be a mem, I would use a mem. It tends to be a little bit tidier. Uh, but I said, it also counts on you not wanting to reset them all or something. Yeah, so the question is, what about a register file for a RISC-V processor? We need register zero to be hardwired to zero. Um, everyone has their own way of dealing with that. Um, I would actually still say you could use a mem for the rest of your file and have a, some sort of special case to handle zero, right? Um, for example, right, rather have a register that's always zero, why not just have like an immediate zero, right? Uh, alternatively, if you want to be really hardcore, you could have a, uh, a vec and the vec, you could actually have a heterogeneous type of having the first thing be a literal un zero that way you can never possibly write it and then the rest be 31 registers. So those, those, those are the options that you might do it. So yeah, you have a few choices. Um, I, I, yeah, but mem's also not, so a lot of places people kind of think, oh yeah, I want registers. And so usually you don't think you use a mem, but a member of mem, not a think read mem, is using registers anyway. So it just kind of matters semantics how you're using it. The biggest difference is kind of, do you expect to reset things, right? And that's kind of the biggest difference. Cool, yeah, good, good great, great question. Uh, okay, so uh, at this point, it's pretty spiffy. Uh, you know, it's gonna handle this case just fine. So what have we done? Okay, queuing behavior. Parameterized data with a number of entries. Our latency is based on occupancy, right? We kind of put it in a free slot and pull it out. It's energy efficient, right? We don't shuffle a lot of bits around. We just write it once, read it once. And now we can do the pipe equals true, right? We can do NQ, DQ um, in the same cycle. And we also support a non-power two number of entries. That's pretty cool. So that's that's all pretty sweet. So what are we missing? Uh, our data type is UN. So that detail of having an arbitrary data type, that's gonna be the next lecture. Uh, but pretty good, pretty good. And I said the whole point of today's lecture was getting to this code is pretty cool, right? I'm oh, sorry, this code is pretty cool. And notice how like you know it doesn't have some of the things from before, right? Like we have. No priority encoder. That's something we did midway and then we used for a while and then we stopped using it for a while. That kind of happens in the real design. You kind of have this incremental improvement and kind of the key step was we kept trying to identify a small thing we wanted to fix. And sometimes they like, fix that small thing as you know, pointed out by you know, the classmates. We say, you know what? Maybe we need to give something else up temporarily to like fix that one issue to get that one bit of improvement and then we'll add it back on. And you can kind of see these, fun these features, right? You can set it. So it's not always you know, monotonic, right? You may have a feature for a while, Maybe you disable it for a while, or you add some more functionality in, and you get a feature working, then you add the feature back in, and then it goes like that. But that's pretty cool. So this is kind of this incremental agile approach. And so today was kind of a good example that kind of showed us. Um, on Friday, I'm going to talk more about the project where you, and up to you, if you'd like to have a partner, will be taking you know incremental iterative agile approach to build up your own generator for the remainder of the course. So the orient everybody, we have Lab 4 homework 4 this week. There'll be lab five, homework five next week. There will be a lab six, hopefully not super long. There will not be a homework six. And then, you know, from then on, we'll be doing the project. There'll be like a proposal and some feedback, initial coding and that kind of stuff. Cool, okay, well, thank you.